Okay, so we're going to declare a quorum and get going. This is uh, Doug Cogswell from Advisor Solutions, and I'm going to talk about the top five ways to get stuff out of your fundraising system. Uh, there's a lot of confusion over this, and we're going to create a framework and just go through different options of what they do and why there seems to be so much frustration with this. And one of our proxies is the CRM systems, the fundraising systems do a great job of getting stuff in, and, and they're like operationally oriented. And there's different things you need to do on the front end to get stuff out. And you don't always need to replace it. So uh, probably somebody designing a fundraising system would kill me for this. But conceptually, there's a variety of inputs. You know, field officers on their their, their mobile devices, uh, gift recording people. They're putting data into uh, basically a database. It stores tables. It could be on-premise or host. It doesn't matter. Conceptually, it's the same. And there's a set of applications and transformations that happen, and then there's some outputs. And these things are all designed basically for operational functions. They're designed to keep a fundraising operation going. So they've got a focus on gift processing, event management, field officer activities, all, all this kind of stuff. But along the way, they need data, they collect data, and they actually have a rich, rich content that they store. And the challenge is how do you get it out in it and you know, synthesize, get it in a form where you can use it. And if you think about it on prospects, it's generally got information on capacity either because you've done wealth screening and put it in, or if it knows where people live, so you can match in wealth by zip codes, or if it's got employment data, you can match out on job titles and figure out are they senior level or whatever. So there's a lot of proxies in here for capacity. It's got a ton of data that can be used to help you understand how engaged or attached somebody is. You know, they Coming to events, they're making gifts. Uh, what's been their experience in the hospital if, if it's a healthcare provider? And interest, you can infer out of some of the data in here their degrees, reunion surveys, if it's in this database, uh, newsletter click throughs. Say it's a major giving, there's a bunch of stuff that can be used to look at the efficiency with which the field officers are managing the pool. How, how big are the pools? Uh, are they being connected with in, say, a 12 month period? Are, the activity levels of the field officers consistent? Are they balancing their activities across the stages and are they moving prospects across stages at a reasonable pace? All this is stored in, in the data. Um, solicitation levels, are the field officers asking at a level that's sufficient relative to the capacity and engagement attachment of the prospects? And this is not, we have a whole nother webinar on this and often this is not measured, but there's clearly data in here so you can create metrics around it. Yield and revenue. Annual giving, the goal is retaining, reacquiring, acquiring non-donors, segmenting people. Not everybody is the same, making sure the messages match. Appeal effectiveness, all the data on the appeals is in here so you can figure out which ones are working with which groups of people. You know, for a campaign, uh, how feasible are the asks? Well, you can bake off the solicitation levels and uh, the characteristics of the prospects and sum them up and see what's possible. How are results coming in? What are the successes and challenges? So high level, these systems are designed for operations, but along the way they collect a ton of really, really useful data. And if you look at it, there are, somebody could probably come up with more, but there are five basic ways to get stuff out. A reporting system connects to those database tables, uh, structures it and puts it out. Often uh, those databases can be fronted with a data warehouse which helps the reporting system or can be fed into a visual dashboard. We're seeing more and more of that. And then there's data discovery. The primary one today is Excel. And then there are data discovery tools. We would be one of these that help you uh, do different things with the data. So let's look at a smaller fundraiser first, and then we'll look at a larger fundraiser. So typically, uh, we come into a smaller fundraiser. There's often just two tools. So here's the data. The fundraising system's doing all the things it does. And it's either on-premise or hosted, and there's usually reports, um, and then there's usually Excel. And these two things uh, do different things. The reports are focused on getting basic content out in a fairly structured way on a regular basis, and data discovery is for slicing and dicing the list, you know, exploring it, um, you know, all the things you could do with Excel. Now, it's the smaller fundraisers could add a data discovery tool You'll see the larger fundraisers may invest in a data warehouse as a cost and there's a time commitment to that. But anybody could um, you know, add one of these 
sort of light footprint front-end data discovery tools, also known as a sandbox, and that also could then help feed Excel because it'd be easier to take the, the collection tables, do something with it here, then dump it into Excel for final work versus try to download the giving table and the events table and do something to merge them together in Excel that's hard to do. And then the thing is, the reporting and the discovery actually solve different problems. So uh, on the ends of the spectrum, you know, for financials, reports are great. And there's not a lot of slicing and dicing. You just want to see where am I, what's going on, what's my results look like. On the other end, ad hoc discovery, you know, a data scientist or, or some power user uh, wants to really muck around in the data and play with it in the sandbox mode. So they need something that's, you know, programmable, uh, heavy discovery, lets you create metrics. In between, there's a lot of stuff. So the reports, great for financials, campaign results, they do a good job. Field officers probably want fairly simple views, somewhat structured. Where these things start getting into trouble is if you start working with major giving metrics. Fine at the top level, but I was just at a client that said, hey, we're measuring, you know, prospect penetration. So if a guy has a, or a gal has 100 prospects and is only reaching 50% of them, who are these other 50? We want to actually drill down, see the 50. And uh, maybe we want to grab the, out of the 50, the 20 who are in the Miami area, because they've got Florida, and we want to drill down and see what events have they been in, been to, uh, what gifts have they made in the past. We want some detail on them because we want to have a discussion about why are they so hard to reach. That's different than reporting. That requires slicing and dicing, drilling down. Annual giving gets more into this because the goal here is to just basically, you know, cut lists. Uh, a question might be, it's now March, uh, do I have any three, four, five year plus consecutive donors who consistently give in the December quarter but then in December, I have some room in my call center right now. Those would be perfect people because something that they normally did, they didn't do to get on right now before they, they lapse any further. That's the kind of thing that a data discovery or you can do in Excel, but it's cutting the list. It's looking at it. It's exploring it. You don't quite know what the answer is going to be. So you need some flexibility. Prospect identification. Often you're trying to create scoring metrics, you know, who's more engaged, uh, who has an interest in financial aid, uh, who's got capacity out of the group we haven't yet well screened, uh, who might be interested in an event in South Florida. We'll look at that in a few minutes. So the issue is these things, reports, Excel data discovery tools, actually solve different problems. And we often see you know, clients or institutions trying to force them into one side when they shouldn't be. So let's keep going with this. Um, the concept is reporting is really good with pre-structured uh, data. A warehouse, there's a lot you can do. Uh, the data discovery is more ad hoc. This is primarily static. This is highly interactive. This is quick. This is, I don't quite know the questions to answer or to ask. And when I see the answer, I may want to adjust the question. Want essential facts? You actually want to see the stories and be able to explore them and discuss them and get into them. This tends to be well formatted. This is maybe sloppier. You're trying to slice and dice and get stuff out. This has standard, well formatted outputs. This is much more of an ad hoc analytical sandbox. Very, very different. So we come back to the larger fundraisers. The thing they generally can add is this data warehouse or this data mart. So it's taking the raw data, the gifts, the events that's stored in here, and it's pre-structuring it. It's creating some standard metrics. It's creating some standard calculations that other tools can use. So, you know, often what you see in front of a warehouse is the reporting system where there's visual dashboards. It's also used to feed Excel and or these data discovery tools. So it's, a, it's like a central repository of truth because you generally don't want the calculations to be done you know, separately in the reporting from the data discovery. So it adds like a universal truth. And these tools, uh, reports can generally run out of the warehouse. The discovery tools can pull some out of here, but generally they also need some of the detail stored in the database. Like at some point, you're looking at metrics, but here you might want to get down to, well, the guy's been to three events. What actually events were they? Or you know, they made gifts in each of the last five years, but how much were the gifts and what were they actually to? That requires the detail that's up here in these source tables. So, um, and I'll also add that the, the beauty of 
the discovery tools and the warehouses, it's easy to add in other data. So I've got all my stuff up here. If somebody comes in with a reunion survey, does this, do the answers to these questions have a material impact on how I think about prospects or not? You can load it in. You can play around with it, explore it. It doesn't have a correlation, does it not? If it does, you might want to put it in the warehouse or put it in the database. If it doesn't, jettison it, move on. Same thing with like newsletter click-throughs. Uh, are they influential on people's attachment? What can I learn from them? If you learn something, then you probably want to put it in the warehouse or back in the database. But the beauty of these things is you these light footprint sandboxes where you can just come in and uh, literally you know, muck around, play with the data, see what matters. Now the problem is, uh, this is typically what the, the larger institutions can end up doing. Uh, end user power empowerment is often missing. So it basically put the warehouse in with a bunch of reports and visual dashboards and push it out to the team. And uh, the goal is that it can you know, solve a set of problems. Uh, there may be a, a misperception of these more analytical types of problems. So there's a belief that this investment here will solve all the problems, but it actually doesn't. There also can be political issues here about you know, lack of empowerment of end users. You want centralized control. So we run into that quite a bit. And, you know, these things are expensive. And once they go in, they actually should work and you want to see them work. So we're not going to allow, you know, ad hoc Excel access to these things. And, you know, we're not going to put a discovery tool in because these things can do it all. And the answer is, yeah, they can do it all. But the problem is uh, there's not that many people can do it. And it usually causes a bottleneck. And we call the bottleneck the cycle of pain. So in that last situation, what we typically see, and I know many of you feel, is a lot of custom report requests because that's going back to the reporting system, to the advancement services or IT and saying, hey, I need a list of my high capacity, highly engaged prospects who aren't staffed and lived in South Florida because we're doing a dinner there. And you get, it takes a while because it's a backlog. You get the answer and it's like three people. Well, it's like, Maybe I shouldn't have started at a million dollar capacity. Let's drop it to 500,000. Okay, now I got 25 people, but that's a couple of weeks or more through this cycle, and it's really, really frustrating. And the other version is, and we've seen this kind of rogue Excel, like they got Excel, so they loaded to figure out how to get some tables out of the database. You get some extracts down, it's hard to slice and dice, it takes a while, it's hard to show. And then this thing persists because they got the data out. And then they keep using it in Excel and it doesn't update again. And that's the problem that happens when you proudly put this in and you leave off the right side here. You end up with a cycle of pain. And a discovery tool um, matters because it's a lot of data. It can help you raise money. It's hard to get at. And it's the end users who suffer um, because they don't have the query tool skills or the database knowledge to go and use the warehouse and the reporting tools to get the stuff out they want quickly. In these cases, adding data discovery makes the existing data that's already there easy to use because people can then see the stories, come to data-driven discussions, collaborate, and make much quicker and faster fact-based decisions. And when that happens, you end up with a cultural change. I mean, literally, you could have a uh, prospect researcher may be sitting with a couple of field officers using this data discovery for this immediate visual uh, data mining where they're coming to conclusions, um, to having a discussion, and, and coming to answers. And they get the answers in seconds because it's speed of thought versus back to advancement services, get the custom report. It's not what I wanted. More collaboration because you can sit down in a room and just have the discussion and you see the stories. You'll see, hey, that's not what I thought. Why? And drill down. Oh, uh, improved metrics and performance because using it with the teams, you actually get down to the level. You go from the high level, like in that major gift example, where, you know, 40% of the pool. Who are these people and who are the ones in South Florida? Like, why? Because these people look like they're really engaged. They're coming to them. And so that's a discussion. That is not just the metric, it's actually driving the story around the people and the performance. And the whole team becomes more analytical, more analytical and more strategic. And we'll jump to this in a second, but let me show you an example. So I'm gonna click and open up a data discovery project. It uh, would have preloaded the data out of the fundraising system the night before. Usually these things do daily loads, they can load on demand. 
the start time you'll see is in 20, 20 seconds, uh, which is basically unpacking the preloaded data into memory. Then it's opening up a dashboard or a project with a bunch of pages where you can have these kinds of ad hoc, you know, explore the data discussions that you cannot do with a reporting tool or a visual dashboard. Uh, it's visual, but it's an interactive, basically an in-memory mart uh, fronting the system. So this thing opened up. It's got, it looks like one, two, three, it's like 10 or 15 pages. And so the, the content's organized in pages. And the first page we're looking at is a list. We'll go through some of these pages. There's a, you know, generally some kind of navigation that helps you understand what's on the page. I'm going to hide that. So this page is literally a list. I'm looking at, looks like 55,000 prospects out of a whole pool of 94. Looks like it opened up with only looking at rated prospects. So let's do a scenario. Uh, so this is prospect identification. Let's say uh, my VP is going to South Florida a couple weeks, and we want to find, are there any high capacity prospects who are also highly engaged or attached, who live in South Florida, who are not staffed? So these are all linked pages, so it's organized in this like horizontal flow. So this rating staffing, there's a map affiliation, all these things, attachment scores, giving history. Go to the ratings page. Here I've got that same 55,000 people, and I'm looking at the capacity ratings from on the left, uh, high, 50 million or more, really high. Um, there's 166 of them. The other end of the spectrum is you know, the 25 to 50,000 capacity ratings. And remember, we, we had filtered out all the unrateds. And here's attachments. By the way, this can come from you know, a wealth screener, like one of our partners, Wealth Engine, or, or you can, we can proxy it off of wealthy zip codes, or it can come from a variety of places and be synthesized or separate or whatever, but here it is. These attachment scores are coming off the data in the fundraising system. And you know, you'll see that the owners are people who have been to a lot of events, made gifts consistently, been to reunions, all of that stuff, because that's all the stuff that's in the database and you can create metrics out of it and score it and here's a bunch of owners. Down here, the other end, these people are disconnected. You know, if this is higher ed demo, uh, they graduated and fled. They've been no events, haven't come to reunions, haven't made gifts, so they're the other end of the spectrum. So uh, for my example, I want to, let's say, I want to grab everybody who's rated 500,000 or up. So it would be this green bar, this yellow bar, and by the way, the hot colors are the higher capacity and the blue are the lower capacity. We're going to use that throughout here. So let's grab, just sweep over with the mouse, those five bars, and go up, get rid of the gray. So I just grabbed 6,306 people who have capacities of half a million or up. And some of them are highly engaged, some of them are owners, some of them are just engaged. Uh, let's say we want the highly engaged owners. Um, that gave me 1,900. Uh, if, if that's not enough when I get the floor, I could come back and add in the engaged. But for now, let's go with this. So there's 1,900 people. The next page is staffing. Same data, same people. Uh, Surprisingly, these are my top prospects. 355 of them are not staffed, and that's like 19%. So I'm a little alarmed at that overall. That might be a different discussion than just South Florida. I also see the color banding in this pie chart uh, is pretty consistent um, in terms of the circles. Um, the hot are the really, really high capacity. I can see those bands are roughly the same, so I've got roughly the same level of high capacity that aren't staffed is our staff. That's a little irrational. For the ones that are staffed, uh, I've got Megan up here has got 135 of them, which is above my target of 125. So there's an issue there. And I don't have all the prospects, so these are low, but maybe they have other prospects. I also see that this guy, Dan Law, has all this dark, dark red. That's the really, really, really high capacity people. So he's got 75 of the very top prospects. So we probably want to make sure he's good and we keep an eye on him. But for my scenario, let's grab the unstaffed, click the pie wedge, and now let's go to the map, get rid of the gray. So now we're going to see where those, um, so I'll drop in a minute, the 1900, um, looks like I didn't grab it. Grab the no, get rid of everything else, go to the map. I've got now 355 people who are high capacity, highly attached, and here's where they live. So let's grab Florida, because that's where we're going. Sweep over in the map, get rid of the gray again, 
and let's drop the map down and look at Florida. So here's where those 28 people live in Florida. So now for my planning, I can talk about, you know, do, do we need to big, bring the pool up? Maybe I should go back and uh, add in the other attachment group because I, uh, I or maybe I should drop, the, you know, the capacity to another level. I could put more people into this, but let's say this is good and I could further, you know, drill down on the Miami area, but this looks like a good group. So now I go to the first page. This is my list. This is dropped at 28, looks like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 28. I go down here, uh, I drop it out to Excel. So uh, I'm just going to drop it on my desktop. Uh, let's just open the thing. So this is this is taking the data, you know, that was uh, stored and collected in, this, in the fundraising system. It loads it generally nightly. It popped it into this data discovery tool. I just played around with it with my team. I like this group for the dinner on uh, uh, in South Florida. And I've dropped the, the data down to Excel and kind of here it is. And again, you know, I've got demo fields here. This could have any of the, the fields that are in. It could have email, contact, whatever. But I can sort of see, you know, I've got Agnes Pitcher, a parent, Naples, Florida, no employment data. So there's some data stats of these people. Um, and by the way, this C-level job is another thing. You know, we, we load in, for example, titles. Uh, you can match out. So if the title fits a bunch of criteria, we will call this a C-level job, which is another proxy for capacity. Um, no employment data. Here's somebody there is employment data, but no, no, not a C-level job. So we're trying to get other flags out of the data that's useful. It's got out of Excel. Now we're setting up for this dinner. I've got 28 people. Let's look at the affiliation. I'm just going to go to another, another tab in this project. What do I see? Um, 11 alums. 23 spouses, four, well, this is multiple affiliations, so some of the alums are invariably spouses or parents or something. 31 undergraduate degrees, uh, most of them have an, so most of them must have an undergraduate, some law. Wow, there's a group in the 60s, classes of 63, 64, early 70s. Let's grab this. Who are these people? I just want to see because I'm setting up for my dinner. Here's the list, and maybe I want to sit them together. I saw something there. Let's look at the giving history. Uh, what are these giving patterns of these people been? Now, picture trying to do this in a report or try to do this in Excel. You would be like dead by now or some, something bad would have happened. Uh, here's the giving history of the 28. Um, we bin the giving because we get the giving table. We can create the bins or maybe it's done in the warehouse if there is one. And most of them are one to $10,000. There's a couple up here in the you know, upper, upper six figures. Overall, this group's been going in the right direction. Good news. I uh, just Jerry Brown guy. I'm going to click him because I think I met him once. What's his story? Now I've got to have the giving history for Jerry Brown. Uh, he's yellow. Wait, what's his capacity? Jerry is a one to five million rated person. And look at this. He's he's uh, wasn't giving anything, and then he peaked up to about four thousand a year through about thirteen, two thousand thirteen, and he's dropped a little peak in seventeen, low in eighteen year to date. Huh. Well, this guy is way under. Um, that's interesting. So I'm trying to just, you know, get a feel for the people as I set up for my dinner. And the last thing I'm going to show is these attachment scores. So here's the 28. I'm going to rank them. Um, this guy, Nyla Bakers, has an attachment score of 0.2, and it goes down to 0.16. So we're using predictive modeling. This would go from 0 to 1. There's some who are higher, but they're not in this group. There's a bunch who are lower, but we, we only went down to highly engaged. Obviously, the disconnected would have really low scores. But here's the metrics that are used to create the score, and then they get binned into these groups. Numbers of committees in the last 10 years. Nyla's been on two, which is why Nyla's probably the top of the list. Numbers of the last five years they made a gift, all five. Six to 10 back, four. Three reunions, played two sports and three student activities. So again, this is all the content that's in the fundraising system. It's just, you gotta get it out, create some bins, groupings, synthesize it, then turn into a useful frame like this where you can play with it. And, and just at this point for my dinner, uh, I'm seeing that most of these people have never been on a committee. This is the most significant thing you can do. So let's get some of these maybe seated at tables by their class years. I discovered that. And let's also like try to get them on a good committee. By the way, what committees have Nyla Baker's been on? Let's click Nyla here. Go back to the committees page. 
looks like Nyla in the last 10 years was an alumni fund volunteer and admissions volunteer of the committee, and her role was enrollment interviewer and participation agent. Awesome. So that's helpful. So got some interest. We know what she likes to do. Um, so there we are. And that's uh, basically the story here. And if I want to go back to the beginning, I just hit here, restore everything, and I'm back to my uh, 54,000 people. I could start another story. But that's a run through of a cultural change that can happen because instead of dealing with a cycle of pain, you're having this like discussion uh, with your team in, in real time. And this 90% reduction in custom reports, is that real? It is. Look at this. This is one of our clients. Uh, they were running along. Here's a request to advancement services for custom inquiries and reports. They implemented advisor. Look what happened. It dropped by 90%. That's, this, we see this over and over again because these requests that the users feel for the custom uh, cycle of pain, uh, frustration, are also causing that on advancement services or IT. And the thing is, when you reduce the workload on this, uh, there can be fear. There can be resistance to this because this is my workload, but look what happens. In this case, I freed up time to, uh, to tackle major new initiatives we had not been able to get to, some of them here. So the whole organization gets better when you use a discovery tool for a discovery problem versus trying to jam a report or a visual dashboard in. They do good things, but they don't do that kind of you know, discovery that we just went through. Just drill down a bit, and then we'll uh, finish up for questions. Data discovery is not reporting or visualization. These tools access multiple data sources. So those examples we'll see in a minute. We, we generally load a bunch of tables from different sources, and then we blend the data together. It doesn't have to all be in the CRM. It can be, as we saw on that little star, it can come from a newsletter click-throughs in a text file, Excel spreadsheets, maybe office or goals are in those. They get synthesized into metrics like Numbers of the last five years they made a gift. The giving table doesn't have that metric, but you could do a calculation on the people table at the giving table to say how many of the last five years that they made a gift. Over 15 bucks, make it some amount, whatever. It gives you the metric. You can model to create the scores, bin them, and then the team gets empowered. This is very, very, very different than a reporting or a visualization uh, tool. Uh, this is a, the, the beauty of this is that the power is this in-memory data mart where you, all the data comes in and you can work with it like this to create that kind of an environment. And uh, just a couple pages on the data. You know, we were playing around with it, but there's all these systems have an entity table. Uh, the employment table uh, has generally different ways of getting the data, but has a job title, an employer, maybe several employers and dates. But we can, you can parse out of the title, whether this is a C-level job or the field of work, and bring it back to the entity table, which could be a factor, a proxy for capacity. So you're giving numbers of the last five years, you obviously can calculate that out of the giving table and copy it back in here. That's what happens in these data discovery and memory marks. Event attendance, you know, by type, last five years, six to 10 years, committees, reunion surveys, all this stuff is mineable in the content that can be used to do those kinds of discovery. In healthcare, uh, we do a ton of work here. You know, you've got the CRM system uh, with a variety of uh, data in it, and then you've got patient extracts coming from Epic or Cerner or whatever it is. And uh, the patient extracts tell the story of the patient in the hospital. So by accessing the two systems, blending it together, creating some metrics, you'll see we can then synthesize out uh, into, for example, uh, higher education attachment. We'll hit healthcare in a second. Uh, things that matter, volunteer positions, been by, if, if it's really significant, maybe been by type, maybe they split. Reunions attended, giving history, all this stuff matters. And what it matters for is trying to differentiate people who have comparable capacity, people who are likely to give at or above the capacity versus people who aren't. And that's what that attachment score was all about. On the patient side, same kind of a thing. People go to a healthcare institution. We do a lot of work in this area. The area they visited matters a lot because the procedures are different. The providers are different. Some of these things cause or create more connection, a more positive feeling. Others don't. And it depends on the institution, what bubbles up to the top, but we often see these things. Age matters. How many visits they've made over some period of time, pick the last four years. 
Uh, the most recent, if there's multiple facilities, facility visited because not all the facilities have the same positive bonding effects. Some may be negative, some may be neutral. So all these things matter, but this is all the, the content that could be synthesized out of patient encounters, much like this is all the content, the kinds of content that can be um, synthesized out of the, the base fundraising system. This is mostly always there. The question is how do you turn it into a useful score in a way that the team can understand it and then interact with it because seeing it by itself, yeah, I've got a bunch of highly engaged prospects that actually want to see how many of them also have capacity, aren't staffed to live in South Florida. So you want to, that's slicing and dicing, pivoting the data to get these kinds of metrics is so that they help you answer a question or solve a problem or uh, provide insight. So back to the main message. There's a ton of data in these systems. It can help you raise more money, but it's hard to get at. And the cycle of pain is really frustrating. And that cycle of pain almost always comes from trying to force a reporting or a dashboard system on a team that's inherently discovery oriented. And, and there are problems that are poorly reporting or oriented and it's usually the things that senior management gets, which is why I understand why that's really important. But the actual team that does the work to empower everybody needs more of a discovery approach. And, and when you try to force the reporting, visual charting tools like the tableaus on the people who need to do discovery, you get this cycle of pain and it's really frustrating. And adding data discovery makes existing data easy to use because you can see the stories and come to data-driven discussions and collaborate and you end up with quicker and faster fact-based decisions. And we understand, you know, my the first tag on this without replacing your CRM, we understand there's a whole variety of valid reasons to do that. Um, they're, they're all getting better, uh, they're getting hosted, all that's good. but there often is a mistake made. They think that the issue is getting the data out. And the problem is they don't have the right tools to get the data out creatively. And we've got a lot of situations where we have stabilized an existing fundraising system for some number of years while they make the appropriate decision on which system to move to. Um, we've got you know, examples with Banner. Um, Banner is a good system in many ways, but it's hard to get stuff out of. I know a number of you are on it. But, but adding this to the front end can stabilize it and make it easy to work with. We've got clients who would say, hey, yeah, it's given us a couple extra years and it gives us time to think about a migration to the appropriate next system without putting pressure on the team. And then when you do make the move, have a great understanding for the content of the data, how it can be used most effectively and kind of what kinds of metrics really matter. So that's uh, kind of the story here. Um, so we said we'd go 30, 35 minutes. That's about what we've got. We've got time for some questions. So there's a um, chat box and questions at the bottom, which I'm going to open up here and see what's come in. Uh, I see several. Uh, okay, uh, I'm getting some help dragging the question panel bigger. So just if you put questions in, we'll either get them now live or uh, we will uh, make sure we get them uh, to you in the next few days. So you mentioned that the tool is is, is essential in an in-memory data mart, is, is, a, is essentially an in-memory data mart. Does that mean it could act like a data warehouse if we don't have one? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so, you know, back to the original uh, model at the beginning where the fundraising systems are putting things in a database. A, a data mart and an in-memory mart do the same conceptual thing they um, take the, the ton, and often is 30 to 100 tables that we will work with out of the database. And it's a, it's a place where those kinds of metrics could be calculated. We looked at uh, things could be bin, grouped, parsed, and structured into you know, useful content uh, versus you got to load and figure out from like 25 tables what to do. They essentially do the same thing. And uh, the issue, the data mart or the data warehouse versus the discovery tool is a general place that's extensive could be used by uh, any any reporting tool, any other tool you have could connect to it and load from. The data discovery tools tend to be like ours today is proprietary. 
you can export stuff out, or we're actually working on exporting stuff back out to the database or the market, but you can't attach reporting tools to them. They're meant for this ad hoc discovery. So the warehouse has the advantage that it structures like a single truth in one place. That being said, you know, they have to be programmed, they're more structured, they're expensive, they take a while to get up. And so often, even with a warehouse, a data warehouse, uh, teams will, we would say, muck around, experiment in the discovery tool, you know, figure out, do these metrics matter? Uh, because in our world, to create, like, numbers of gifts in the last five years um, at the prospect level, you're basically writing a, basically like an Excel macro in our authoring wizard that basically says, look at the giving table and perform this calculation and put it back at the NAD, NAD table. You're not touching the databases, and it's very easy. And if you don't like it, you just throw it away. If you like it and it's valuable, then that can be programmed into the data warehouse. And then you have the advantage that all the other tools that you have, the reporting dashboards, whatever, can you all use it? And as I said, we are working on how to get those calculations you know, from us back to the, the, the major fundraising systems. We are partners with you know, Blackboard, Lucian, Agilon, uh, Salesforce, uh, most of the major fundraising systems. Did you create the attachment scores or were they done in-house by a consultant? How customizable is this? Uh, a great question. Yeah, those attachment scores, generally if we're, there's two answers to this. If we're building a project and there aren't any, uh, we have predictive modeling in our app, so we will uh, create them for you. And the thing is, uh, the weighting institution, institution varies a lot. Like in some cases, you know, reunions are gonna be the thing on the left, the most important, uh, they, they're really bonding. In other cases, they're way over on the right, even for an elite private school. So the weighting really matters. So what you, I don't recommend is taking some standard industry general formula. I've seen some of them. You, you, it's not that hard to do the analytics to get the weighting for your institution. Um, so generally, we will create them. And our modeling is embedded into the app, so it's basically like running another Excel macro. You just click build model, it brings up a wizard. Our vision is Excel savvy people who aren't stats people or coders ought to be able to do this. And then it writes an equation. Another, it's like an Excel macro. It's an expression it writes back into the entity table. If you want to edit it, you can literally go in and edit the math and save it, or you can rerun the model. So it's really easy to do. That being said, we also work with a number of the campaign consulting companies and some of them do modeling. So if like one of these came in and just did modeling and the math is there and you might argue their models are better than ours, um, my team probably wouldn't like that, but they're, they're good. We can take that math and embed it in our app so we can use that instead of our modeling tools. Uh, it literally we're just like, it's like Excel macros. So it can go um, both ways. How did you actually create the attachment scores? We actually have a webinar on this, um, which if you go to our website, uh, which I'm gonna open up here just to show you. I've got three panels open in front of it, but um, hold on, advisor. There's a page on our website called resources, and the resources right here, there is a uh, webinars, under webinars, right at the top is going to be a, one we ran in the fall on major giving, developing and using um, alumni and patient attachment scores. I would suggest going there. High level, the idea here, here is you're trying to figure out what influence is giving, right? right? And there's a couple of things, capacity. So you need some proxies for capacity, uh, wealth screening, you know, wealthy zip codes, job title, whatever. You can create composite, that's another story. Then what you want to find uh, for the attachment is out of the things that create connection, how many events they've been to, how many years they've given, uh, the kind of reunions, all that stuff, which are most influential on explaining why people of equal capacity, some have given at or above and some haven't. So generally we would take everybody who's got a capacity rating over $50,000. It's a population of people. Say it's, I don't know, 30,000 people, whatever. And out of that group, you know, 300 have given over that. That would be the target. And then the predictive modeling will try to use the factors, the numbers of years that they've given on, on the committee events and create a weighting uh, that describes how each of those factors influence or explain 
why uh, some people gave over 50,000 uh, and the others didn't. And it'll put weightings on them and it's going to have a bunch of transforms. So, you know, events, uh, how many events they've been to, you know, maybe, you know, one event matters a lot, maybe two events matter twice as much, then maybe it starts dampening. So four events is not twice two events, it's, you know, 1.2 times two events. And then 10 events is, and it caps at 10 events or something. So the math will figure all of that out. Um, the same thing with like, you know, geography or distance, you know, sometimes it's log functions. Like if you live a little bit out of the way uh, and come, uh, it, it's as important as you live a long ways out of the way, but sort of once you're out of the metro area, the distance sort of flattens out. So it figures all of that out. And then it will figure out for like events, maybe some events are more influential than others. Um, so you might want to then bin like influential events versus neutral events. And maybe some events just anger people. So it's negative. Uh, so that's that's how you do that. And then you sort of, if you do this work, the math, the actual running the model isn't that hard. We, I think we've simplified it. But it's the discussion that matters a lot. Like you need to talk through, does it actually make sense that somebody who's been to 10 events uh, will only be a little bit more uh, likely to give than somebody who's been to four? Yeah, it probably does because at some point, like I've been to events. You know, so you go through all that. It doesn't really make sense that I've got four hospital locations and one of them is negative. The other three are positive. What's up with the one that's negative? And actually, this is a real example. One of our clients, yeah, it does make a difference because that one hospital was trying to like build in a big addition and, and it was a neighborhood was up in arms about it. So it actually had a lot of negative press. Okay, makes sense. And then so that discussion is really important. Uh, if you do these things, but that's how we do it. Um, and we, you know, our goal is to coach teams on how to do it. So you've got it. You don't need to keep come back to us. Uh, you can do it. It's easy to change the formula and you're, you're off and running. We've had really good success with that. But at the beginning, we would normally set these things up because we've done it a bunch of times. Uh, how do you handle really messed up data? <laughs> or what if we don't have, think uh, we have m enough data? Uh, great. Uh, so that's like messed up data, missing data. So one example of missing data, you're trying to find large prospects and you've, you know, you've got 40,000 people and you have wealth screen 10. What about the other 30? If there's gaps like that, uh, there's proxies for it. Like, and maybe the, the issue is we don't have enough budget to get them all wealth screen. Fine. Let's use wealthy zip codes. It's public domain. It's free. Uh, we just load that in and we use that for the other 30,000 or 20,000 for now. Um, we, you know, we have partnerships with Wealth Engine, HEP Data, uh, Coalesces, a bunch of them out there. So we also can help clients fill holes if they can, you know, pay for. There's a bunch of providers that can fill content gaps like this. Uh, messed up data. Yeah, we've got one we're working with right now. That's in the. We just discussed it like an hour ago. The uh, proposals table also has the staff assignments because I think the issue was. They couldn't, in the staff assignments table, assign multiple prospects to, I mean, yeah, mul multiple staff to the same prospect. So uh, what we do in that case is we'll load the proposals table, and then we, we and our tool could split it into two pieces. We need to break it off into a proposals table and separately into a staff assignments table because they're totally different things all in the same table. That's kind of messed up data, but... Uh, that's exactly what we do. And then if you don't like it, it's easy to change. It's harder to change it in the database. Uh, and I know in that case, the database actually doesn't allow multiple staff assignments of the same prospect. We had another one uh, where they had a ratings table and somebody started putting like alumni events in there. So it was like a two weirdly different things. We, we actually didn't know it. We found it. Just split the table in two. Um, we also can write rules to work around gaps and stuff. So as long as there's some systematic way to untangle what's been done, uh, a front-end discovery tool like ours could untangle it. Uh, I, ideally, that ought to be cleaned up on the back end, but you know, we've also got things where codes get messed up. So it's supposed to be coded one way, it's coded three different ways, that's fine. We can write rules in front of it to bring them together. Believe it or not, uh, there is actually a bunch of uh, bad data and missing data out there. I would say, however, I don't think we've ever had a situation we've gotten into where there is not enough data to start doing something with it, right? I mean, at some point, if you've got some content on the people, you're basically trying to find uh, 
capacity, uh, things that show interest. You're trying to look at giving history, especially the annual giving. Uh, if you got the giving table, the entity table, some content, there's usually a bunch of things you can learn from it and express out so a team can use it. And you've got, I know in this call, we've got higher ed who are blessed with like knowing a population for 50 years. Um, and, and you know a lot about them. You've got healthcare that knows the population for a bit, uh, but it's not the same long-term thing. And you don't know as much about them. You've got not-for-profits who know a lot less about uh, their their base. But there's ways, usually, I think I say, and then you kind of make it better. How long does it usually take to set something uh, up like you described? Usually takes us, good question, uh, you know, six to 10, 12 weeks uh, from when we start a project to build out something like I just showed. And if you look at the steps, um, we have to understand the underlying data. Like, hey, this table actually has proposals and staff assignments in it. Surprise, we actually got, so we didn't quite expect that it needs to be split. So this usually, you know, takes us, I don't know, 10, 12 days of our time, which usually spans six to 12 weeks because we need review cycles and all that with the teams. But to build one of these, yeah, it usually takes us like four days to untangle the data, maybe another three or four days to make sure we've got it in forms that make sense to the team, you know, and whether the model scores, they need to be discussed a couple more days, and then we usually do a a couple of days of training and stuff and follow on empowerment. Um, but the the beauty of a data discovery tool with an in-memory MART is it's it's faster, it's lighter, it's more flexible. If you try to do the same thing in the database or the data warehouse, it would take a much longer time because that's a much more structured um, environment that's got to have a lot more rules and guidelines along it so that's how we can just do these things fast and then they're just more flexible the thing you lose is you know a report is 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 very structured pixel perfect uh you know it, it has a set of things it can't be changed easily which is you don't want the financials to be changed easily <laughs> you, you might want the annual giving uh, slicing and dicing to be changed a lot so they they actually are very different. So we're totally faster, and that's a typical time frame. Can you make this recording available? Yes, uh, this has been recorded, and we'll have it up on the website within a few days. I'm getting a nod. A few days. Uh, give us to next week, and then we'll push it out so you'll you'll hear about it. It'll go up on the. Uh, well, I'll show you where it's going to show up. Uh, it's going to show up uh, right down here. Data modeling and teams and it's going to show up uh, right above creating a culture of analytics um, there's a bunch of other webinars here that are already there but that's where it's going to go uh, can you save the story in advisor and come back to the same place another day another great question uh yes there is i think i shut the demo down um yes well so i'm not going to show it because uh, i've got all these panels up which are the questions but but what i was running that let me just, let me try it. I'm being told I can actually do it. I can shrink the panel down, um, bring the demo back up, uh, go back here, hold on, show you exactly what happens. Where's the demo? It's back here. Yes, there's something called a flight recorder. So I'm gonna go back here, launch the demo again, and uh, it's gonna come up in a browser. By the way, we, I'm running off a browser version. This could be on-premise hosted, runs in Windows desktops. Where it runs really doesn't matter. Uh, it just needs to, at some point, get access to data, which we, as I said, we partner with the leading uh, fundraising system people and host it on-premise. So for us, it works. It's conceptually the same. Uh, so this is loading up. There's a thing called a flight recorder, which tracks each step. I'll, I'll just show it briefly here. I'll go through the same scenario quickly, uh, and uh, you'll see what it does. So I, uh, I think I opened this thing up. I think I closed the panel right here. And I'm going to go back to the first page, the ratings page. And now, and, and as I do this, there's something up here called the uh, flight recorder. So this is open. So every time I click on something, it's going to track it. So like, I'm going to sweep over this. It's going to show me over here, I made a selection in the bar chart and capacity rating. What did it do? I did. I selected these things. Here's what it looked like. I then exclude the gray. 
Um, then I went over here and grabbed this, and it tells me what I did. I select the attachment scores. Great, got it. And I got rid of it. Then I think I went in here. Let's go to the staffing. So basically redoing the same thing, and it's tracking every step along the way. Uh, get rid of it, the map, and so forth. So if I want to go back, so I'm down to the 355 people, I can go back up to here, maybe to here. Uh, exclude the unselected array and click this one. I can go up here and um, return to the state. Click that. It's going to take me back to wherever I was uh, before I selected that, the 1900. And I can save these things. Like if I did this one point, I can save it as a well, I, I can import a bookmark if I want to go here. I can save this as a bookmark, um, create a bookmark. So if this is something everybody's going to do uh, a lot, you want to get to this point, I would save it as a bookmark. It could be private or public. If it's public, everybody can get it. You could call it, you know, Doug's uh, um, unstaffed, high rated, whatever in Florida. And then you just click it, you would go there. And it's as new people or the population changes, selection state is not baked on those 28 people. So the counts might change if more people move to Florida or whatever, but that's generally what you want. Um, you can also, if somebody's doing this all the time, you could put filters on it so you don't have to click the three charts. So this is discovery mode where like, this is a new path maybe that wasn't done before. If, if all the time somebody's gonna grab those same conditions, this first page has little checkbox, you know, text filters, I could create filters for scenarios I want too. So it could be one check takes me to the scenario because I can create conditions on it. So there's several ways of doing that, but we are big on uh, uh, helping you understand what you did. You know, this is the like the cookie crumbs, but then letting you save the state so others or you can go back to them in the future. Uh, and an author, you know, this is ad hoc. Any end user could do this. Uh, an author would come in and say, hey, why don't we add a new filter in here, you know, for uh, unstaffed people uh, of high capacity, then maybe you want to then go to the map uh, to just sort of grab where, Florida versus California. Yeah, I also point out these these uh, flight records could also be emailed around. They're just small XML files that then attach to the file and, and run uh, web version or client version. That was a good question. Um, trying to find the questions again. Got another five minutes or so. We keep having questions. I will keep answering them. I had to hide the questions to see my desktop. Okay. Uh, what do I do? Click here, drag something. I'm getting help getting my questions back. Give me a second. Oh, here we go. Yeah. There's, what are the primary uh, purposes which these discovery tools are used? If I go back to the PowerPoint, and let's just come back to it. And if I back up a couple, um, and hide this and go back to the bottom of one of these. Hold on. Yeah, the bottom of this is the um, the discovery <laughs> the discovery uh, tools are back up one more. Sorry, i um, got like all the controls in front of me. Yeah, the the uh, where these are used, and we have solution templates for a, a number of these. Like I was showing prospect identification, so I think somebody asked how long it took to put in. This is sort of a basic one that a lot of, I don't know, we have 400 clients. We have a bunch of clients with this. And this is probably the most common one because it's very data discovery oriented. We also have a solution template for annual giving, which is also very data discovery oriented, which I didn't show today, but it's, it was webinars on it on that webinars page. But this is all about uh, the, uh, finding out which appeals are working with which groups of people, trying to segment the non-donors into more likely, middle likely, less likely, and trying to focus the messaging so you get more revenue without blasting everybody with a lot of generic stuff. And major giving metrics is another big area we do a ton of work in because it's not, and we've done a lot of talking on, you know, you don't want to just measure visits. That's field officer activity. You want to measure how the pool of prospects is being managed. And that involves, uh, if I have 100 prospects, how many of them am I, am I visiting in a year? 
uh, how many of them am I actually connecting with? And the Odyssey numbers up at like 80 to 90% for connection and 40 to 50% for actually visiting. And you want to be able to drill down on the ones that haven't been connected with or haven't been visited and ask the questions why. And the same thing on the stage moves. If you've got somebody who's got a bunch of prospects in qualification for over a year, you probably want to drill in on those and ask questions to see who are they, who is connected with them, all of that. So the data discovery uh, works hugely here. We've got a solution template for this. We also get involved with field officers to the extent they're trying to slice and dice lists. The work you do here can be used over here, although these visual dashboards and reports can also move in this direction. We've also, um, you know, we'll push out campaign results um, you know, especially this is a web-based, tablet-based, or whatever, because if we've got all the data in here, it's an easy progression in this way. We probably will not do financials because that's totally reporting. But these things, as they become visual, it's obviously an extension, but there's this in-between zone here where either side could do it, but there's a set over here that really aligns towards discovery and over here more towards reporting. And obviously, campaign feasibility is something that can come out of prospect identification, and we have a solution template for that as well because it's basically taking – you know, expected value calculations off capacity and attachment and, and adding them up into groups and trying to cut it different ways and create campaign pyramids. So the discovery stuff sets a foundation that can be used in some of this, and this is sort of a set of dashboards that can push out in between. There's some overlap area is guess what I'd say about that. Does that make sense? Getting odds in this room. Um, cool. Uh, go back, because I go right at about the 2 o'clock time. Um, looks like we... This one, trying to look at questions again. Looks like we uh, cleared off our questions. That's good. Um, so I, I say just uh, thanks for the time. Um, you know how to reach me. It was on the last page here. Uh, we'll go back to it. So feel free to reach out. Uh, you will get a notification when this is recorded and posted, which will be in within the week. Showed you where it would be. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I say this is work we've done a ton of, we love doing. Uh, hopefully, we've helped clear up some of the uh, mis of reporting and these visual dashboards versus data discovery tools and why we're seeing so much cycle of pain out there. Uh, we love uh, alleviating that pain. That's sort of one of our missions in life. So thanks for listening to our story. Uh, take care and have a great afternoon.